What are you doing here in Waimana? I came here to stay with my whānau because I'm having treatment for cancer. The greatest challenge of the dance with cancer is that it becomes all-consuming and it can take away your focus from other important things like whānau, like what's happening in the world. I take lots of deep breaths. One sort of does it has much choice. Eh? One does the best one can. One dances with the cancer. the thought leader of his generation, I think. One of the most calmest, coolest, and most articulate advocates and leaders, I think, that the old Māori's ever seen. He's got a really good sense of humour. He's actually quite funny. A lot of people only really remember that they laughed quite a bit while listening to him, and he's telling the most radical stories, but especially Pākehās will come out and say, oh, they really enjoyed that, or he was really fun and they don't realise that they've just heard the jokes, but the Māori heard the message. Well, everyone called him the whispering Jesus around here. Never raised his voice, never got demonstrative, but each word was like a boom, a hammer dropping. I think that Moana's contribution is just to have articulated so strongly that uh, Māori knowledge is valid and powerful. He's one of the greatest, if not the greatest, jurist in the Māori world of um, the century. So whether he sets direction in that criminal justice space, whether he's setting direction in that constitutional space, he sets the direction. Yeah, he's been a lot of things for a lot of people, but he's always been there for us. He was just a younger brother. Yeah. He well, needed a right. good kick up the arse every now and then. He was obviously a really good student, you know, prefect and all that. How'd he blab on? Yeah, he was a bush lawyer. We call him Joe Blow because he was a great talker, always was a great talker, eh, Fred? Always a great talker. Yeah. I first met um, Moana when I was very young and uh, he was just starting his research on Hefai Pānga Ho. It was uh, Māori and the criminal justice system. The minister, Geoffrey Palmer, was, was shocked at the statistics of Māori in jail. And so he commissioned this report on basically why there are so many Māori in prison and what can be done about it. We had over 6,000 people come to our hui. We talked to over 600 Māori who had either been in prison or been the victims of harm. So it's the largest Māori research-based project that's ever been conducted in the country is now a seminal piece of work that is referenced by really anyone that is talking about Māori concepts of justice. And the line of thinking I'd come back to from his work is this idea that you can't get justice in an unjust society. Criminal justice systems reflect the communities or societies in which they operate. Same idea that where you have a system that doesn't reflect all of the people in that community, their ways of thinking, being and doing, then you're not going to have a just justice system. Moana, in his methodical way, basically said this is about colonisation. And that wasn't something that the Labour government was wanting to deal with. In the 1980s, our report talked about the re-establishment of a Māori justice system, which caused huge controversy at the time. Every single community said, we need to have our own legal system, our own Māori criminal justice system, whatever that might look like. 
you could have parallel processes to the Pākehā legal processes. It's not like his Pākehā system, his Māori system. It is what Te Tiriti promised us, which is that we'll take care of our own stuff. And now we have to deal with the harm that colonisation has caused us. We've done some doozy arguments in the criminal court, challenging the criminal justice system, saying that there was an alternative criminal justice system before they arrived, and there had never been the free prior informed consent to, to dismantle that. When people talk about, oh, you can't re-establish a Māori justice system. There can only be one justice system for all. There was a lot of opposition from uh, within the criminal justice sector itself to being examined by a Māori uh, lawyer. We uh, also faced resistance from the police who denied that they were over-policing Māori communities from uh, the prisons uh, and corrections. They were all in insistent that they were not the problem. Māori and Māori communities were the problem and the issue and that they deserved what they got. When there were the issues about the publication of He Whai Pānau, there was this real struggle with Mona's integrity of maintaining the argument that was in that report and not bending to the enormous pressure to rewrite parts of that to make it more acceptable to the Crown. That was one of a number of examples where Moana's integrity was inviolable. What I saw in Moana was absolute, uh, resolute determination to uncover uh, the criminalisation of our people as connected to colonisation. So they took what Kim Workman is often called the safe parts of the report and set about by culturalising the criminal justice system but ignore the substantive issues. You can't just, you know, put a muckle on a police car and then expect that things are going to change. In terms of policies about increased visibility of Māori and criminal justice, uh, in terms of hiring practices and processes, all of those things have, have kind of come to, to fruition in that 30-year period. All of the really... Um, difficult, sticky parts of criminal justice have not gotten any better. There are tikanga things all over the criminal justice system. There are lots of Māori staff, people who are doing good work. But the situation hasn't changed. In fact, the situation has got worse. The tragedy is, at that time, uh, Māori incarceration was 50%. Now it is 53%. It's what Tracy McIntosh calls an accepted feature of the New Zealand landscape. What we've learned since then is that that's not a Māori experience, it's an Indigenous experience. In Canada, for example, in Manitoba, where the native population is less than 9%, the total population of the youth justice facilities is made up of 97% Indigenous young people. Goodness. In fact, the greatest increase in Indigenous imprisonment rate in the last 10 years has been among Indigenous women. And so we decide to ask a slightly different question. That is why do states with a history of colonisation imprison Indigenous peoples? They imprison Indigenous peoples because they need to control Indigenous peoples. What we both recognise that at the moment the system reproduces that harm. It doesn't make us more collectively secure. There was a report published that said, well, the reason for the disproportionate number of Māori in prison is because we come from the lower socioeconomic group, which brings with it considerable risk factors. Well, proportionally, there are actually more poor Pākehā people than there are poor Māori people. So if it was just socioeconomic thing, there'd be more poor Pākehā. There's been research project after research project, which when you factor in for socioeconomics, you factor in for education, all those other things, the only difference that's left is, is race. And we can't deal with these issues until we address the legacy of colonisation. I think the biggest thing that we may not all agree on is about having true structural change in how we get there. Is it a tinkering of the system or do we just change the whole justice system? Can you work within it? Can you work outside of it? 
he talks about completely dismantling processes and getting rid of prisons, you know, entirely replacing the justice system we have. That's an incredibly radical thing to say. It's not that I disagree, it's just I don't know that I have the same kaha, the same strength or certainty that he has about doing the right thing. One of the first hui we had in this round of research, this young woman stood up and said, I I came to this hui 30 years ago with my mum. I don't want to come back in 30 years and ask the same question. But that's the risk that we will take, and the challenge is whether this country is actually prepared to take that risk. I was named after my Uncle Mona Ngāremu. Uncle Mona was my dad's cousin. They joined the Māori Battalion together. Uncle Mona was killed in Egypt after the war, so the story goes, and Mum was hapu. They went to visit Nanny Mariah, Uncle Mona's mother, and said that if this baby's a boy, can we name him Mona Nui Akiwa? They stayed at Tupado with Uncle Peter Awatere, and he had a dream that night about another Ngāti pro tipuna called Kofakatua Kina. And he said, if this baby's a boy, you call him Kofakatua Kina. My kuro just decided that he wasn't going to have any of his mokopuna just having Ngāti pro names. You're kidding me. Was he going to be more? So <laughs> he decided that I should also carry the name Taraya. That's a lot of names and weight in history to bear, eh? Yeah. There were six of us. There were also two other brothers born before mum and dad were married, Bill Napier and Bob Jackson. Although they weren't brought up together, Uncle Moana was always very fond of the old man because dad was a, a native Māori speaker and brought up in the old style. Also, mum and dad whangai two of our cousins, sons of um, mum's sister who passed away. Our grandfather was Everard Jackson, who was um, a bit of a sports hero, and his uh, two brothers were um, were Māori All Blacks. Born here, rugby, All Black, 2-8 Māori Battalion. If you've seen some photos of Dad and Mona at the same age, spitting images. Mona was also Dad's godson, and he does like saying godson. He says, no, that's my uncle. The God part sort of doesn't sort of fit with more. He's saying, you're my godson. Oh, uncle, could you say I'm your son? My dad was badly wounded when he was in the Maori Battalion in the Second World War. He was blown up by his own people. Friendly fire. Football had been his life. When he lost his leg overseas, I think that played a lot on his mind that he would never play again. And secondly, was the idea that he actually never saw combat during the war. I never really knew Dad. He was in and out of hospital because he was, um, well, what we now know as post-traumatic stress disorder. He became very mentally ill, which led to his breakup with Mum. We never really knew where he was most of the time. Because his father was in the sanatorium, eh? So Dad and them would look after his father and they'd visit him in Purido. How old were you when your dad died? 30. Yeah, I found it really, uh, really sad because after we buried Dad, we sort of tidied up all his bits and pieces and, you know, and there wasn't much to show for a, for a life other than us. The first delegation of Māori who went to the UN, led by Ngānako, and I was honoured to be in that, was 1988. Ngānako Manhinek fought for years to stop the iron sands at Waiuku being dredged where the Urupā were, and she heard that there was this place called the United Nations in Geneva. Geneva is one of the most expensive cities in the world. That first delegation that went over, we all shared one room, and there would have been six of us, seven of us. So Nano came back and started talking to people and said they're setting up this working group from the rights of Indigenous peoples and we need to be there. As far as first appearances go, 
he made an immediate impact. He came in talking about te no rangatiratanga and self-determination. It resonated with everyone because it helped sort of pick us out of the issue by issue approach to looking at it in a more strategic and political sense. You know, the years, particularly as we began drafting the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, it, it expanded. The impression that he made in Geneva wasn't just because of his brilliant mind. There were many Indigenous women who fell in love with him. <laughs> Have you had any big romances in your life? Oh, all the time. That's been the problem. You silver fox, you. Yeah. <laughs> Through our own journeys, we'd all ended up in Geneva. And by 1992, when I was chair in the Indigenous Caucus, we had over 3,000 Indigenous peoples. The order of the day is that you would talk about the issues that were facing your people, and then from that, people would extract the core issues that could then be distilled into the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Some countries like Japan just said, oh, it's not an issue for us, we don't have Indigenous Peoples. Oops. And then the Ainu people say, oh, he's, here we are, here we are. Shima Hokkaido ni sunde, soshite okina ido mo naku krasteita. I would say that one of the greatest achievements of the UN Declaration was actually the journey to develop it. The journey of learning about what has happened to Indigenous peoples globally is something that is so rich and that no one can ever take away. To all the Indigenous, indigenous representatives from around the world, you have travelled long distances physically, but also in the struggle to achieve your rights. Was there anything binding that came out of that declaration? No, the way human rights institutions function is if they begin as a declaration, then they accumulate what becomes known as the force of international law through practice and usage, and then eventually may be recognised as a convention. But none of those international conventions are necessarily binding. There was this notion that the sky would fall down if society ever allowed Indigenous peoples to have rights. When New Zealand finally reversed its position, life just carried on. The struggle to have this declaration recognised has been a very long time coming and I would like to pay tribute to all of those others in the Māori community, who, just to name a few, Moana Jackson, Aroha Mead, Nana Kōman Hinnock. There is an expectation that you're going to pick up the wheel because even when we got things through like the UN for the development of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, I rang him about three in the morning and all he said to me was, oh, good on you, boy. I'll see you when you get home. And it's that quiet kind of affirmation. You know, you hang up and go, is that it? <laughs> and that is it. Because he's achieved what he wanted to achieve and that was support you, help your thinking. And then when it's achieved, he's just like, good on you. I was kind of saying he's my uncle when I was at the UN, saying oh, yeah, he's, he's my uncle actually, so that helped a little bit to break the ice. But yeah, he, he played a huge role in the UN, kind of paved the way for, you know, the younger generation that have been going over there. We call on the permanent forum to reaffirm our rights to self-determination and status as tangata whenua to our lands. When you travel the world in that, don't you find that everyone's always fascinated with Māori? Yeah, one of the things that I hope happens too is that our mukapuna will have to devote less time to reclaiming the beauty from all the hara that's been imposed upon us and they'll have more time to enjoy it. Enjoy the respect that should come to being Māori here at home and not so often wait to go overseas. And we're getting there in that regard, I think, but we're not there yet. All of them absolutely adored their mother. She was a woman that never had to say much, but she certainly commanded respect. When his mum and his mum's friend, they were voting for Kaugane, 
And his mum could vote because she's Kokogunu, of course, but she wanted her friend to vote who was a Pākehā. And I'm at the polling booth, I said, your friend can't vote, auntie. Why not? She's not Kokogunu and she's not even Māori. But I want her to vote. Next minute I get a call from Mona. I'm taking Kahagani to the United Nations because <laughs> my mum's free can't fight. I said, Mona, this is fucking mama. He says, yeah, but she's my mum. And he couldn't say no. He says, just humour my mother, please just say yeah. <laughs> Let her have a vote. You don't even have to count it. Mum became a solo mum before there were benefits or anything like that. So our kuro, her father, came and lived with us. He played a very important role in, in, in our upbringing. And his greatest sorrow was that we never learned to speak the real. Yeah, bloody kids. Can't even speak your own language. Were there any teachers that particularly resonated with you? Yes, there was one who told me I should write, that I should put down in words what I thought, and that if you believe in justice, you have to be able to write what you think. And I thought it was waffling at the time, but I realised how perspicacious he was, really. How what? Perspicacious. It's a flash word. Full of flash words. <laughs> what does that mean? Full of insight. Mm. Your brother told me that you were pretty good at rugby. Like most state boys' schools, rugby was God, and if you could play rugby, make the first 15, then you had a certain sinecure in the school, and I quite enjoyed that. You got a special first 15 rugby cap and blazer <laughs> and things like that. Yeah. Which are very important to yes. an adolescent boy, yes. you know. Yes. He broke his collarbone and that sort of did his rugby career in. And the person who broke his collarbone was a cousin of ours. Oh, was it? Who yeah. was that? Doc Wheeler. Oh, that's right, yeah. Gisborne boys. Gisborne boys. He was always a, a bit of a sports nut, brought up in the Jackson family. They're all sports nuts. Mona's grandfather was in the English um, rugby union team. We were brought up in a very labour family. Our grandfather was a trade unionist, mum was a trade unionist. During the uh, privatisation agendas in the 1980s, her home became the home for all of the unionists to go and strategise there about how to stop the freezing works from closing down in Whakatū. She would be in the kitchen cooking for all of these great union people. It ran through the whole family, uh, this commitment to the labour cause. So um, what were you like at school? Were you like the brainy one? <laughs> oh, my reference from Hastings Boys High School, the last sentence said, here's a fine example of the native race. <laughs> I guess I must have been something. It may not have been what they intended. So when you finished school, what were you wanting to do? I went to law school to save the world. Didn't surprise anyone. Because his big brother, uh, Jim, he started off doing law too. I think Mona uh, followed in his footsteps. Did you get admitted to the bar and all that, the hair thing? No. And, no? No. Got your degree? I got what I call the trade training certificate, but not, not the uniform. He talked about when he went overseas to um, Colombia to do his masters. His professor there was a key mentor of his in teaching him about critical thinking. So I'd heard about Native American organisations which were essentially community law centres. Yeah. Staffed by Native Americans working for Native Americans and I thought, well, if they can do that here, we can do that back home. Mm. We became, I think, involved at that time establishing Ngā Kaifaka Marama i Ngā Ture, which was a alternative legal advocacy institute that he uh, provided legal advice from in Wellington with Karen uh, Wycliffe as she was, Judge Fox as she is now, and a number of other young lawyers. And we also established the Māori Law Commission as an alternative to the New Zealand Law Commission. If you're prepared to stand up for your land, your mana is not lost. We see this as just simply the beginning of a whole decade of protest and of intensified struggle. The Jacksons are, are a family that were very respectful of each other's views, but their views weren't that diverse from each other anyway. Uh, I think we're pretty much all on the same page, really, eh, Fred? I yeah. mean, we did, there were lots of discussions and arguments, that's for sure, especially as everyone got older. My dad and his two brothers, they were, they were very politically energetic. They'd salute the flag one day and then they'd be swearing about the crown the next day. So when Mona and 
Sid were hitting the headlines. Come here, my nephews. I think you should join the Pakis. And, of course, Mona and Sid would look aghast. Reporter Ron Taylor asked Sid Jackson what he hopes to learn from Colonel Gaddafi's regime. We will be looking uh, at the way in which that country operates. Uh, we have never talked about any desire to import violence into this country. What about dissension? Violence has been visited upon us uh, by colonialism. Uncle Sid was the sort of brash, out-front one, you know, he'd uh, take anyone on. Uncle Moina is more like Dad, understated, but he's especially brilliant. How did your mum respond to the kinds of conversations that you both raised in public? She would often just sit and listen and buy a look. <laughs> We would know whether she approved or disapproved, but she never questioned the stance that any of us have taken either because in many ways it was the stance that she and her generation had taken anyway. I always get emails from him at four or five in the morning before he does his walk. That's his best thinking time. Quite often it's the most provocative questions in the morning, like have you read uh, the papal bulls or the requiento? And I said, no, I haven't read that for a long time. And he says, we need to read them and challenge the uh, inculcation of the values from the church into the design of sovereignty through the indigenous nations. Now, who, who re writes to you at four o'clock in the morning, you know? The Crown has based its whole power on what I call an illusion that on the 6th of February 1840, every Māori in the country woke up and said, we don't want to make our own decisions anymore, we're going to give it to that lady in London we've never ever met. Well, I don't know of any iwi that's ever done that. We are in an interesting phase where there have been more Māori in Parliament than ever, and friends of yours along the way and relations like Tariana and Willie. How has that changed things, you think? Well, in the end, so long as we bear in mind that Parliament is not a tanga house, it's a kāwanatanga house, and there's a place for kāwanatanga, but it's not a place that will deliver rangatiratanga. He told me not to go to Parliament. He said to me, I don't know how you can reconcile it, believing the things that you believe, and you're going to go to Parliament. He told me that I would regret it. And he was right. I was in La La Land thinking that maybe we could change the system the way it was. And of course, we couldn't. I felt angry. I thought, God, I must be so arrogant to believe that I could help create that change. He's not a condemning type bloke, you know. He, you know, he understands the pressures on people and, and he's quite supportive, actually. That's why he's a guy who's worked with the police. He's a guy who's worked within the system. The, the big element that one always brings to us is that what may be necessary is unlikely to be sufficient. Uh, we've learnt to um, understand the limits of participation in the system. That period of protest from the early 70s to the early 1980s um, made us rethink some of our participatory roles. The ongoing tension is always, do we reform? Do we stay outside and try and slam it over? It's a pretty immovable beast. What, what are your observations now about the way forward? You know, I think in many ways that's a false choice that's been given to our people. You must go and reform the system from the inside, but what do you reform it to? You can't reform it to a rangatiratanga house because that's not what it's established to do. But at the same time, our people have striven since 1840 to make a safe space as that house gained more power, rather like the doctor's Hippocratic Oath, that Māori people do the best they can to ensure that no harm is done. But it's never been and should never be the end goal mm. of our people. And at the same time, we need our whānau and advocates and people working within the system to be the patu against the harm that it's causing our whānau every single day and our children every single day. He makes you think, is, is it really possible to, to roll out some of the things he wants? I don't think so sometimes, <laughs> and I've said that. Um, in saying that, it doesn't mean to say that we can't roll out aspects of, of, of what he's talking about, but it's just how far can you go within the system 
that we have now. He has been very generous in understanding that for many of us, the system as it currently stands is important. So we have to reconstruct with care. It's still a, a system that's based on Western thinking and it doesn't seem to be making room for um, mātauranga Māori fast enough or with enough enthusiasm. I have been in iwi space, I've been an iwi chair, and it is difficult when, you're, when you have that crown hat on, because you're thinking, come on, cut our our people a break here. We want co-design here, we want code governance, and so you're trying to shift the crown into that space. The trouble is you start to think that any of the changes that you are able to make are great. We get thankful when we stop the state from taking our kids willy-nilly. We think we've done a great job, but we don't ever address the underlying issues because they're too hard. I think everybody has doubts, self-doubts about whether you're doing anything valuable or whether you're a sellout. And he, he's incredibly affirming to come back and say, what you're doing is really important. Someone needs to say those things. I really appreciate it. The strength of colonisation and the success of colonisation is that when we as Māori are existing in the different spaces trying to push for others, is that you get so distracted in our lanes that we don't get the time to operate how we would, which is the together spaces. Well, I'm thinking back to when there was no Māori in Parliament, and that was a deafening, invisible void that we were in as a people. I mean, we've got more allies and champions now. What are those choices? I think the question is, when does incre incrementalism become stasis, the consolidation of an injustice, whether it's the increase from four Māori seats to seven? That has not fundamentally changed. Yes the injustice. Mm. That is a classic tension in anyone who is a radical thinker from one who is still willing to work within a system. It's whether you just promote big change, constitutional change, or you look at things in incremental ways of steps towards uh, something bigger. He's extremely understanding that there's no perfect place to be and that sometimes you have to have time in, time out. And it's just having someone to think that through with. Change is happening and I think that that's the important thing, not to, to feel too overwhelmed. And I say this to myself as well, as someone who's like got the patience of this much and who's like a whole how of like this much. But then I'm reminded like <laughs> when I looked at Matsua and I'm just like, oh, I'm so exhausted. <laughs> and then it's just like, sit down little girl, but you carry on. His latest, most greatest um, endeavour, which was Matike Mai, with uh, the assistance of the Iwi Leaders Group and Professor Margaret Butu. When it came to talking about constitutional transformation, the question we were asking people was, if tomorrow you could make your own decisions about your own lives, what would it look like? And that was really the fundamental question. And then the question that came immediately behind that was, and what sort of values would you base that decision-making on? He would put an idea up and it would actively require debate and then would seek a confirmation of strategies and outcomes about how we're going to ensure by um, 2040 that um, we would have reclaimed sovereignty in this country. Mātiki Mai has had such an incredible impact on young people that gives them, they actually see the tools to create change. I was in the earlier stages involved in the Matiki and my group. It was an awesome opportunity to actually be able to work alongside my koro. You know, he had wānanga with 15-year-old young people right through to um, people that participate as capitalists in the system. Those were doozy debates about whether or not economic sovereignty provides Māori sovereignty, right through to iwi leaders that were doing treaty settlements, to people in jail, to people that recently um, uh, released from jail. He always used to go to the solo mothers who he sees as the real um, leaders of our communities, looking after their children in situations where they'd suffered the risk of trial removal. So he had wānanga for those kinds of groups. 
And of course, he would always search out philosophers wherever they were. Moana went to every single one of those 252 hui. I went to about 50 of them. And it was very clear that we cannot proceed in a way that upholds the values and upholds the original agreement we had with the British, unless we go back to those original agreements. Justice is simply the maintenance of air, that's EA, the maintenance of balance and relationships. Now for that, you are not going to be fiddling with the existing constitutional arrangements. You're going to have to look at something quite different. In other words, you are going to have to do a transformational uh, work on it and think within a completely different framework altogether in order to um, come up with a constitutional arrangements that will allow Māori to make our own decisions about our own lives in our own country. The current power structures that we have cause massive damage. And if we're looking at Aotearoa for what an alternative looks like, there's only one place to look. The treaty required, as the Waitangi Tribunal said, the establishment of separate spheres of influence. And this country is yet to get to the stage of establishing a rangatiratanga sphere of influence, kawalatanga sphere of influence, and what we called in the Matiki Mai report a relational sphere of influence where the two houses can come together to make joint decisions. His vision for the future is can be quite daunting around constitutional transformation in Matike Mai around the justice system, but you know, I want to see those changes. Do you feel optimistic? We set 2040 as a goal for some quite profound changes, and I think that that will happen. People just have to be brave enough, and if enough people can be brave, if enough people can unlearn racism and injustice then we can actually build good relationships in this country. We, re we can reclaim what Te Tiriti promised. Uh, this guy came up to me who I didn't know and started talking. Turned out he was principal of Wainui Amata College. And he rang me about a week later and said, I'm just wondering if you ever considered teaching. And I said, no. <laughs> And he said, well, we're going to set up next year. And this is what makes him, I think, one of the unsung heroes of the real movement, because Wainui Mata College became one of the first, if not the first, state school that introduced the teaching of Māori language as a wow. core part of the curriculum. Yeah. Jim McGregor, no te Raukawa. He was our principal and he had a real vision about where One El Mata College could go in terms of advancing the aspirations of Māori in education. So I went for a year and ended up staying for nine. So hang on, did you have a teaching degree? No. How does it work then? In those days you could just walk in. I met Moana when I was a student at One El Mata College. He taught English and te reo Māori. He was a role model, model and an inspiration for all students actually that went to that, to that school. He's the teacher who introduced uh, people like Patricia Grace, all those Māori authors and poets. And so we'll go into the library and there's Hone reading a poem. Wind furrowed are the sea pastures where white horses prance. Your eyes marry me the corners of the heart, a mouth up tilted. Simple, do it like that. Thank you. <laughs> Mona was also the school first 15 coach as well. I became a part of that team. We weren't as big as other teams, but we kind of like punched above our weight. A lot of people can't imagine him being a rugby coach because all they know him is this lawyer, so-called activist, and that's all they have seen him. During 1981, you were coaching the school rugby team. How challenging was that year for you? Well, we talked about it as a team that I was going to protest. The difficulty was that if I hadn't coached at that time, there was no one going to be available to coach. So I found coaching that year very difficult and often it meant rushing from coaching the boys to 
protesting on the motorway at Wellington or something, but that's an involvement that my whanau had had for a long time opposing rugby contests with South Africa. He would visit every Māori whanau and meet with your, with your parents and work through issues. If he felt you were going off the rails, he used to just sideline you for a moment and talk to you about your responsibilities. In my own home, things weren't going too well. Um, and then I was given a choice um, and I ended up being with Mona. He not only became my father, but he also became my mama because it was just us two. So he provided a roof over my head. He's provided that opportunity for me to grow, really, as a person. When Ani Makaere, she left the Auckland University and Waikato University to set up her own Māori Laws and Philosophy paper, and she asked for a small group to assist her. I taught for the first few years of that, but Moana stayed there for several years to build up the course from Laws 1 to Laws 4 over a period of about 12 years. He's a mentor, I think, and, and he's still a teacher. You can't get rid of that. He's a teacher. If you had to rate the Crown, what would you put on their report card? If they do not improve their performance by the end of the next academic year, I will expel them. It's very ruthless. <laughs> <laughs> There was a well-known park house scientist, Roy Fennick, who had cancer, and he said, oh, I, I don't see it as a battle. I didn't invite him to the fight. So I prefer to look for life beyond that, I think. Cancer is a very complex business, especially in terms of the layers of understanding it. There's so many different types of cancer, and so when you just hear the word, you go through various stages of grief, and then it's very difficult to come to grips with my cancer. Tell me about the beautiful book that you were given. How did that feel? Well, the two in part, Carlo Miller approached some other writers and wanted to make a contribution that might honour me and also help me when I was unwell. And the way they felt they could do that was to put together the publication of poems and artwork and so on, and it's one of the most touching, amazing gifts I've ever received, really. My role is uh, sometimes translator, sometimes a negotiator, sometimes uh, staring down the people who want to give us less, because in our literature we see doctors and nurses and treating physicians make assumptions that we want less. You know, we accept death, and maybe we do, but we want to give this innings a good whack too. I think we cope with it, as far as I do, to make sure Warner is, is fine, as, as, as good as can be. I just do what I think I need to do. We're also his place where he doesn't have to be all on all the time and doesn't have to always be thinking about what he's going to do next and how else he's going to save the world, I guess. We're kind of his safe place where he can just be put off. I hear that you are a bit of a neat freak. Is that true? I try to be, yes. yes. Every plate, every cup, everything in the pantry was always exactly in the same place when he cleared the table. So I go into the bathroom and I just brush my hands on the soap and I'd put the soap back in his particular place. He'd come in after me almost invariably and he'd turn the soap back to the position he had before. When we'd go, Sid would go, Warner will be going crazy now. He'll be in the pantry because I put everything out of order and he won't be able to stand it. So is that part of your drive with the Crown to force them to tidy up their mess? Yes, and to trust us to look after ourselves because we will make a mess at times too. But there will be our messes to fix, our messes to prevent. Goodness, we can't do any worse than they've done. He's seen his brother go through um, cancer and treatment is hard on bodies. And treatment is hard on 
minds. It challenges you and your family to think about where we are in the future, in the past. Sid, before he died, he said, here's my dying wishes. I want you to carry them out. Here's my ohaki. And he gave me three pages of instructions. And same with Mona. Mona says, I'm dying here. Here's my instructions. I says, don't do that. You know, don't um, preempt or forecast because it will happen. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Has this experience that you are part of now, is that kind of giving you a different focus or sharpening it somehow? I don't think it's crystallised my attitudes towards what should be happening for our people, towards a sense of justice and fairness. In fact, it has frustrated that sometimes, I think. I, I sense a real sadness there uh, with him because he's someone who loves life and he's so giving that it's not about him, it's about te ao Māori. He's spoken to thousands of people. He holds their stories. And the cost of doing that work, for him, the cost of getting it right. How hopeful are you that we might be able to mobilise towards real transformation? There's a group of young people, Māori and Pākehā, who are actively working towards constitutional transformation, the Tōiwi Mō Mātike Mai. And I take real heart from that because that's a conversation which wasn't even on the horizon 10 years ago. Mm. Pākehā in very powerful positions, mm. reflecting, commenting, actually using his words and thinking about system change. There's a tiny group of people called Papa, People Against Prisons in Aotearoa, which has for a number of years now been advocating the abolition of prisons. And there are other groups like Asians in support of Te Noranga Tiratanga, Just Speak and, and many others now, which weren't there before. We're still a long way off. I do think we have a duty to be optimistic. He still thinks he has to carry the world on his shoulders right to the end. He says, if I can do work, I know I'm well. That's his yardstick. Some people, when they, when they get in this position that you're in, being very ill, they find religion some kind of something. I'm just, you know, just canvassing, just canvassing. You know, I think he has coped remarkably well with his illness. Because knowing that you've only got a limited time, it must be very, very difficult. You know, facing up to what he's facing, I just think he's been he's shown real strength. He's really grown in my um, estimation from that point of view. Because as kids, we used to think of him as a bit of a wimp, didn't we? <laughs> we could never do anything wrong in his eyes, even when we were wrong. <laughs> The mokos are very important to Mona. His whole wairewa just lifts when he sees him. We love to have him close. We're all pretty hopeful though, so it's one of the strongest men I know, so. I've just always believed that there's a cyclical nature to Papa. Mm. I've often said that Whakapapa is a series of never-ending beginnings. One end comes at a different beginning, and I'm at that point in my life.